morning. Good. I, I want to read to you from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. You were created in the image of God. Can we rejoice in that this morning? All right, let's do it. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. Oh, we could do better than that. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. All right. Awesome. Well, you guys can go ahead and grab a seat. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the youth pastor here, and it's my privilege this morning to greet you and just welcome you to church. We are so glad that you are here with us, for those of you in the room, as well as watching online. And if this is your first time with us, I want to I want to help you out here, give you two little tips. First of all, in the seat back in front of you, you'll find an info card. 
And that's just like the first point of contact for us, the first way that you can get connected to us, that we can get some information about you so we can begin that relationship. And the second thing I have for you is really handy. It's our Church Center app. And this has everything that you need to know about Riverside, about us. Um, it's just, it has all of our announcements, all of, it has our calendar, um, it has the message notes. So if you want to get a head start on getting connected and knowing more about us and being a part of this family, that is going to be a big help to you. Like I said, I'm Pastor Sam, and here at Riverside, we exist to help you find and follow Jesus. And we do that as one church in two different locations. Our brothers and sisters at Oakmont, they are worshiping and they are bringing the word um, in unity as one church. And we are so, so grateful for them. And part of my job this morning is to let you know of the announcements and the things that are coming up. And the first one is important for you to know because it's coming up in about 15 minutes, and that's communion. So we are going to uh, join at the Lord's table this morning through communion. And so if you don't have your elements, you can find those at the table out front. So it's important that you have those. So that's the first, th first thing that's coming up. The second thing that is coming up is the Women's C Group Launch Picnic. That is next Sunday. Sorry, guys, I don't have any uh, announcements for the, for the gentlemen. This is just for the ladies. But next Sunday, August 18th, and that's going to be from 5 to 7.30. And heads up, if you want more information about that, it would be really good to download that app that we just talked about. So that's next Sunday from 5 to 7.30. That's going to be at the Parkside campus um, and that is the only announcement I have for you this morning. So we're, we have a, a gr wonderful Sunday planned for you this morning. More worship. Like I said, we're going to enter into communion. And then Pastor Amy is going to bring the word. But before we do that, I would just love for us to just center our hearts on Jesus. Can we just do that? Take a moment. Just center in on his glory as, we're, as we prepare to sing more about him, to receive his word. Maybe we just need 30 seconds of quiet just to get any unconfessed sin, any of that out of the way. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, we submit to you this morning. We surrender and we open our hands for what you have to give us and for what you want from us this morning, Lord. And we're ready to step in to the new, into what you have for us, Lord. And so we come to you, we praise you, we bless your name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Church, let's continue in worship.
really appreciate that song this morning. It reminds me of an important truth that I think sometimes I can lose sight of, especially when partaking in communion. And that's the truth of Jesus being both fully man and fully God in that moment on the cross. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but it's easy for me in a time of reflection during communion to remember Jesus the man. And I think that's probably a lot to do with the imagery that, that comes to mind in this moment, reflecting, picturing Jesus as a human being hanging from the cross, bloodied and beaten. And that's important. That's important because if he hadn't been fully man, if he hadn't lived a human existence, and if he hadn't done it sinless, if he hadn't done it perfectly, then he couldn't have atoned for our sin because God requires that the same human nature that makes us sinful be the sacrifice on the cross, and Jesus is the only one that did it perfectly. It's, it's harder for me to remember sometimes that Jesus was equally God in that moment. And he was victorious in that moment, not just three days later when he rose. He wasn't a victim in that moment, right? I think I can, I can get that idea in my head. Here's this helpless guy that, that's being beaten to death, dying on a cross, but he wasn't. He was King Jesus in that moment. He was fully God fully divine in all of his power and all of his strength. He was a willing sacrifice for me that day and for you that day. What a beautiful idea that is, that we have a God and a Savior that cared so much for us that he willingly died in our place. I'm thankful for that reminder this morning. If you want to get your elements out, we'll partake in communion together here this morning. First Corinthians 11 tells us that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. passage goes on to say that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup together. Lord, we come before you here this morning in this time of communion and this time of remembrance of the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. Lord, we are so thankful that in your humanity and in your divinity that you would sacrifice yourself to save us when we could not save ourselves. Lord, I pray that we would maintain that focus through the message this morning and through the week as we go back to our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you so much for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen.
encouraged by his sacrifice this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we stand before you. We just take a moment to be still and just thank you for what you've done on the cross. We never want to lose sight of the reason why we're here, the reason why we do anything. It's because you loved us enough to die a sinner's death. Lord, we praise you for that. It's the only thing we'll ever do is praise you for that through everything we do, through the way we live our lives, through the way we interact with people. Lord, I pray that everything we do would be to glorify you. And I pray that you would just open our hearts to hear from you this morning, to hear what you have to say. Speak through Pastor Amy and just be with us all. Bind us together as a community in fellowship with you. And I pray this in your precious name. Good morning. There we go. My name is Amy Nichols, and I am excited to be here with you this morning as we continue to study God's Word um, in the series that we're in, Into the New, which is where we're taking a slow, purposeful, intentional look at the book of Romans and everything that Paul had to say to the believers in Rome, both the Jews and the Gentiles. Now today, as we continue, we're going to go on to chapter 13 which in many ways piggybacks off of chapter 12, because in chapter 12, Paul was telling us all about being living sacrifices, and last week, Pastor Mike showed us what that looks like as far as the nonconformity picture. But Paul is going to show us here in chapter 13 how all of that looks as we live and operate in society. Now, there are a few parts to the chapter, so as I began studying Weeks and weeks ago, I just read through it multiple times and see what God is pulling me to. And immediately, over and over, he drew my attention to verse 11, where Paul writes, Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. It was as if the words wake up literally jumped off the page into my eyes, and I could not stop thinking about them. And God showed me how those words wake up could apply to all of this chapter, all of this book, and really everything that we deal with um, specifically, though, in what we're talking about today, how we operate in society. So I've titled the message, Wake Up. Now, at the time that God gave me this title, Wake Up, I was actually at the beach with a group of friends, um, a girl's trip, and literally at the same time that God is drawing me to this title, Wake Up, my one friend, Sherry, you might know her, she attends the Oakmont campus, she's telling me about how I kept her up all night with my talking in my sleep. We were sharing a room, and I am a huge sleep talker. I don't know if you can imagine that. Um, but this whole, like, sleep talking, sleep walking thing that I do, I have done it my entire life, and I obviously have no control over this thing, but it, I really do feel bad when I disturb people's sleep because I'm up, especially my husband of 23 years who's had to learn how to deal with my antics in the middle of the night. But I need to know that I'm not alone. So is there anybody who walks or talks in their sleep? Thank you. Yes, there's, there's more than just me. Okay. Um, so... It can be, for me, it can be as minor as just like as I'm rolling over, I'm whispering a few things. Or it can be as major as the time that I woke up in the garage having no recollection of how I got in the garage, which is terrifying. Um, but many, many times, I would say most of the time, maybe my husband would agree, um, he tells me that I am sitting up and loudly telling my students to sit down or be quiet or do your work or whatever it is. I'm telling my students something. Um, one time I was frantically getting ready, trying to get ready for work in the middle of the night in my sleep because the parents were going to show up at any time. This is what I was going with in my dream. And my grandmother even tells me that when I was young, I actually had a full-blown conversation with my big brother who was sleeping in another room, and she was in the middle of the hall, like, what? We were, we were talking, and both of us 
we're totally asleep. So it's actually terrifying if you think about it because you don't know what you're doing or what you're saying when you're asleep. You're totally oblivious to all of that. And as I began to think about this, I realized it wasn't a coincidence that God was telling me that the title should be Wake Up and that my friend Sherry is telling me how I kept her awake with my sleepwalking, sleep talking, sorry. Um, because when we're sleepwalking, we can appear to be saying normal things. We can appear to be doing normal things. We are functioning like a human would, and yet we're totally oblivious to the fact that we are asleep. And um, many of us right now might be walking through life, appearing to everybody else that we are Christ followers, saying with our mouth that we're Christ followers, appearing in our actions to be doing all of the things that a Christ follower would do, but yet we are not fully awake to the things of God, especially how we operate in society. And that's what Paul is addressing here in chapter 13. We're operating in our flesh, but our spirit could be totally checked out. When I'm sleepwalking, I don't see the dirty dishes in the sink. I don't notice that there's clothes on the floor. When I'm sleepwalking, I'm oblivious to all of that because I'm only paying attention to what my mind has conjured up, to what my mind tells me is reality and what I think is good. And so we can be in life focused on what we think is appropriate, what our mind is telling us, or heaven forbid what the world is telling us is acceptable, but be totally oblivious to the things that God is actually trying to show us and tell us. We can actually be sound asleep. And really, if you think about it, it's also equally terrifying that sometimes the people around us, like my husband, who I trust and love, Sometimes, especially at the beginning of our marriage, he could not tell if I was sleeping or awake. Even to this day, sometimes he's like, honey, are you sleeping? Because I'm like saying something that maybe could make a little sense, and he can't tell. And so think about that. The people that we trust, they sometimes can't tell that we are sleepwalking through the things that God would be showing us. Or they're totally asleep too, just like my big brother. So to find out, in fact... If we are awake today and if we are tuned into the things that God would be saying to us, we don't need to look uh, to our friends or family. We don't need to go and Google anything or get on social media. All we have to do is get before the one who created us, the one who knows us best, who has a plan and a purpose, and ask him, we need to ask him if we are awake to the things that he is trying to show us and tell us. At the end of the message, we are going to seek God together We're going to gather in prayer, but that's really just the start of it because it means moving forward. We have to daily, intentionally ask God to wake us up. Shake us if you must, but show us, God, the areas that we are not in line with what your word says. We have to seek him intentionally. So today as we explore just one of the things that God is instructing us in this chapter, um, let's remember that it's only when we're wide awake that we can really, truly function as he would have us in a society. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you today, and we recognize that we are often a mess, and sometimes we think we're doing things so right because the world tells us it's right or our our fellow believers tell us it's right, but God, in order to truly know if we are awake to the things that you are showing us and telling us, we have to seek you, and so I pray today that you would wake us up, that you would show us how we are functioning as a member of this society, and that you would show us, Lord, that all authority belongs to you. And we give that to you today in in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, there are a few parts to this chapter, basically two parts to this chapter. So the first one has to do with government and authority, and the second part has to do with loving others. Now, I can tell you, when I began studying, I was fully intent, fully and completely intent on addressing the latter part about loving others and staying far away from the part that talks about government and authority. Uh, Let's just say, given the current state of our country, I don't know if you noticed there's like a little tension um, in regards to government, politics, nobody feels it, just me? All right. Um, But for me, I was hesitant to talk about those things, but I won't give you the whole story, but basically God showed me how Authority doesn't just mean government. Of course it means government, but it also means your bosses. It also means your parents. It also means your pastors. How many of you have a boss? Anybody have a boss? Wow, it's a lot. Keep your hand up. How many of you have a pastor? Keep your hands up. How many of you have a parent? How many of you are aware of any political leaders or government leaders at all? 
all the hands should be up right now. So, okay, you can put your hands down. So that means this applies to you. And so um, here, God, oh, well, also God wouldn't let me say no. I, I tried really hard to say no, but he would not allow that. So here we are. We're going to be studying verses 1 through 7 today. And here Paul is going to give us Christian directions, directives for our daily walk as we are operating in a society. We know that this is not our home. If we are belong to God, heaven, we are a citizen of heaven, and that is our eternal home. But while we are here on this planet operating in a functioning in a society as a member of a community, we have a job to do. We have a job to represent Jesus well and to point people to him. So let's begin. We'll read the whole thing, verses 1 through 7. Um, Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. I have to stop right there for one second. I think Pastor Michael's wearing off on me because he often pauses in the middle. Um, but I, when I read that section, that verse, I immediately think of speeding. And like when I'm driving the speed limit on the highway, I'm not, my heart's not pounding and I'm not looking around every corner, but right when we are running late and you start to like give it the gas, don't, your heart starts beating really fast and you start looking around like, is there a police officer? Any? Like, is that not, that's how he designed it to be because we have that fear that they have the ability to punish. Okay. So you must submit to them. Not only to avoid punishment, but to also keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. So right away, we can see from this whole passage, the very first thing that stands out is that we need to wake up to God's view of authority. And that view is that it all belongs to him. Every single piece of authority belongs to God. Now, he established systems and places of position and appointing places of position in order to enact those systems so that we can maintain order and we can, um, you know, restrain evil and promote good. He's set up those things, but he is ultimately in control, and all authority belongs to him. Ephesians 121, speaking of Jesus, says, Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Nobody, I mean, literally, absolutely no one that you can think of has authority over God. And that none of them have the ability to take authority from God. And nobody would be in power unless God allowed it to happen. He has all the power, and he can choose at any time to remove anybody, whether it be that boss, that government leader, whoever it is. He has the ability to do that. He has the ability, actually, to command each and every one of us to obey every single one of his commands, if he so chose. But instead, he gives us free will, because why? He wants us to love him. He wants us to be able to accept his free gift of his son and his sacrifice. So he gives us the ability to choose, but with that, we get to choose a lot of other things. But let's never get it confused. God is never, ever, not ever out of control. Um, Tyler talked about that already, that even on the cross, he was in control. And when he comes back, guys, every single knee is going to bow and every single tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. But in the meantime, we as his followers here, we are to reflect him. We are to preach and show his love to the world around us. We're not here. He didn't call us for the purpose of cleaning up society. He didn't call us to like fix some of the things that we see are wrong in government. He called us here to show his love and to demonstrate that love to all of those that we meet. We're here to deal with eternal matters. So once, I feel like once we can um, have an awareness that he is the authority and that everybody else who is in authority in our lives is actually him, him, he's ordained, then we can have a much easier time doing the things that Paul's talking about. Starting at the very beginning, 
verse 1, it says, everyone must submit to authority. We know that when we submit to authority, we're actually submitting to God, and we're bringing him honor, and we're glorifying him when we do that. But also, you saw it in the text, like a good parent, God will discipline those who do not submit to the authorities that he's placed in our lives. I think it's interesting that he didn't say submit to all authorities except those corrupt ones. He didn't say submit to all the authorities except those bosses that are rude and those bosses that are demanding of you. He didn't, that's, that's not in the text. When Paul wrote this, he was not assuming a perfect pastor, a perfect government. He was not assuming any type of condition. He had no line that had a condition about the quality of the leader that we're submitting to. He was inspired by God to write these words exactly as they are. And he was writing to believers in Rome who were operating in a pagan, godless system. And he knew that. And yet so many times, you and me, I mean, I'm, I, if I could only share with you the conviction that this whole studying has taken the, the, the path that I've been on. But we are really, really good at being able to use excuses like that boss is X, Y, Z, that leader is X, Y, Z. We have all these reasons that we're really good at coming up with for why we should not submit to the authority that he's placed in our lives. But here's the thing. Christ is the only one who is perfect. That means that that boss that you have never will be perfect. That government leader that you're thinking of, never going to be perfect. You and me never going to be perfect. So that whole idea, like, I don't have to submit because da, 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 it's now washed away because nobody is perfect except Jesus himself. And God just showed me how arrogant I was becoming at being able to justify all of the reasons I could have. Guys, I'm good. I'm really good at making up reasons why I should not do what you're asking me to do. And you know, being able to justify why I went the opposite way of what you told me. And our country is actually like in a downward spiral in this area, if you think about it, and, and actually encouraging each other to do these things. You shouldn't have to do that because, da, 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 like, we're good. We're really good at encouraging each other. But the reality is it's hard. It's hard to show honor and respect to people that didn't earn it or we feel don't deserve it. Why should I respect them? They, they don't earn it. They don't, but in verse 7, in most of the other versions, it says honor to whom, whom honor is due. It doesn't say honor to whom honor is earned or, or deserved. That word there is honor to whom honor is due. That honor comes with the position of authority that we remember God has put into place. God has placed authority in our lives and leaders in our lives, whether it be pastors, teachers, um, government leaders, all the list goes on and on as police officers. He has placed those authorities, and the honor and respect that we give is because of that position, not because they deserve it or, you know, they're doing the right things in our eyes, and so, okay, I can honor and respect you. We submit and we pay honor because they are in authority. Here's a scripture that I came across. Guys, this scripture still has me shook. I'm not even joking. It comes from Eugene Peterson's translation of Ecclesiastes 10.20. Listen to this. Don't badmouth your leaders, not even under your breath. <sighs> and don't abuse your betters, even in the privacy of your home. The conviction of the Holy Spirit here, because we're good. Like, I'm at home. I can let loose, right? I can just say the things, think the things. It's private. But this is saying don't, not even under your breath. And I'm not even a political person. I try not to, like, get involved in the public arenas because that, that's just not my thing. But God just had, did not hold back in showing me all of the thoughts and all of the things that I have said, whether it be about my boss, about a government leader, about whomever, that were not honorable. Because here's the, the real kicker, and this is what he showed me, and I'm sure it applies to many of us. On the outside, we're really good at pretending to respect you and to give you reverence. We can do all the actions, but inside, our hearts are not honorable to that person. I can portray 
and I think I can trick most people into believing that I respect you because I'm doing the things that look respect. But God is the only one who can look in our hearts and see, do you have the honor in your heart for that person that I've placed in your life as an authority? Whew. So we know that man looks on the outward, but God looks at the heart. And so if we want to wake up in this area, we can pray Psalm 139. Here's what it says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Trust me, if you start praying this prayer in relation to how you operate and function under leadership, under authority, God will, I promise you, show you those areas very glaringly, but also very lovingly, because he's here to help us. He, he is living in us for that exact purpose, so that when I begin to have those non-honoring thoughts, the Holy Spirit can trigger my spirit and say, ha, 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 ha. we're not going to do that. I'm submitting to God as my authority. I'm submitting to his reign, and they will answer to the king of kings for themselves, but so will I, so will you. And God is never, ever going to be caught off guard and say, like, wow, I didn't know that authority was going to be in place. What am I going to do with this? I, I'm stuck here. That's never going to happen. He is God. He is sovereign. He is always in control. So our job is to not tell him how to do his job, but our job is to submit to the authority, the leadership that he has placed in our lives. And I know what you're thinking because I was thinking it too. What if the authority figures tell us to do something that goes against what God says, right? That's what we like to come up with. We like to think of reasons <laughs> to not do whatever it is. Um, here's what's cool. As I was studying this text, I found out that Paul chose the Greek word hupotasso. Hupotasso is the word for submit, but it means to arrange things respectfully in an orderly manner. Hupotasso, arrange things respectfully and orderly. He did not choose hupokuo. Hupokuo also means submit, but it means obey what you've heard, follow a command, or conform. Why did he not choose that word, and why did he choose hupotasso? Because there's a difference between submitting, respectfully keeping order, falling under the authority that God has placed, and just straight out obeying. Submitting understands that God has placed this authority in my life and that I'm going to, because of that position, respectfully get in line, get in order, do what I need to do to keep the peace, so to speak, instead of just um, downright, you know, often though it is going to be obeying because let's think about it. Most of the time, what we're being asked to do is not going directly against what God is saying. Most of the time, it's just inconvenient. We're going we're to come to that in a minute. I'm jumping in my mind because I'm so excited. But um, think of the times that people that, uh, in the Bible did not obey. Daniel, he kept on praying when he was told to stop. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the idol. We can think of Rahab, who hid God's people and then lied about it. Uh, the midwives who did not kill all the Hebrew babies, but Moses was saved. Joseph did not commit adultery. The three wise men did not return back to the king as they were told to come tell him where Jesus was born. And Peter and John kept on preaching, even though they were commanded to stop. But here's the thing. Every single example that I found, they disobeyed because it went directly against what God had commanded them to do or to not do. It was not because... It was inconvenient for them. It was not because it made them angry or embarrassed or put out. It was not because they had to suffer. It wasn't because they didn't like that government leader or they didn't agree with that, um, you know, boss. It wasn't any of those. And those are often the reasons that we give for not obeying. We're really good at making up reasons why we should not um, hupotasso, submit. For them, it was a specific command. And so we have to recognize that for most of us, that won't be the case. Most of the time, if we look at the things we're being asked to do, they're not going directly against what God has said. Most of the time, it's just that we don't like it. It's not fun. We're not, you know, it, it might dig into my free time a little bit or whatever. I'm thinking personally. Um, but if we want to submit and keep order, then we have to 
seek God. And if we think we should disobey, seek him and ask, God, show me. Am I being rebellious? Am I being selfish? Am I just thinking about me? Or is this actually your leading? Because he did lead Daniel to keep praying, obviously. He did lead the Hebrew boys not to bow down. And here's the thing. Even when they disobeyed, they submitted to the consequences that came along with that. Daniel was still thrown into the lion's den. The Hebrew boys were still thrown into the fiery furnace. Jesus was still whipped, beaten, crucified. All these examples, even when God led them to disobey because of his command, they still had to submit to the authority. And to, Is that what we can say of ourselves? Or do we get all worked up? I know I do. I get all worked up. The whole submitting thing, it is not going to be easy. I promise you. If you ask God to help you do better, you, it will be very difficult. And it actually will be impossible without his help. We are, we are not able. The reason it's so difficult for us is because we were born in flesh. We were born in sin. And that every act of sin is a direct opposition against the ultimate authority, which is God. And so our flesh will default every single time to pushing back on authority. Our flesh will default every single time on not wanting to obey, not wanting to submit, wanting to oppose those who are above us. And so we have to pray and we have to ask God every hour sometimes, please help me to be submissive to you through this leader or through this government. Um, because the world, it will gladly have you back. The world will say, come on, we do, we love backstabbing and cheating and lying and gossiping and all the things. They will just gladly welcome you back into it. So we have to intentionally ask God to keep us realigned. As we go on in verse 6, we read about paying taxes. And we realize that if we're awake to the things of God, then it's our responsibility to do our due diligence as a member of society. Paying taxes, whether we agree with them or not. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Does anybody know why he was born in Bethlehem? Because there was a command that everybody had to go back to their hometown to be counted for taxes. <laughs> Census for taxes, ultimately. Um, and I think Mary and Joseph had actually the biggest reason to disobey. They could have been like, no, we're carrying the Son of God. We are not going back. But what did they do? They submitted and they took that long journey and risked their lives to obey the command that was given. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans during a time when the hand of Rome was so heavy. Actually, em Emperor Nero is still known as one of the most horrible leaders of the time. And I just imagine that Paul is writing this while that's all occurring. And even at the end of his life, when the Apostle Paul is about to lose his head to the command of Emperor Nero, I just imagine him like closing his eyes and whispering, the powers that be are appointed by God. Are we able to have that same attitude over these much lesser things that we get worked up about? Are we able to say, wow, I, that, that is crazy, but the powers that be are appointed by God? Or do we get in an uproar and immediately start fighting back against authority and all the leaders? God is in control, guys, and he will delegate and he will appoint and he will still be sovereign no matter what is going on in those areas. We've even seen times when God allowed evil to rule, which, you know, we're like, what? He allowed evil to rule? Sometimes it was to judge the people, to direct them to a certain place, or even to bring them to their knees in recognition that you cannot make it without me. Earlier, actually, in chapter 9 wrote, um, of Romans, Paul wrote, God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power. Pharaoh, if you don't know about Pharaoh, go read it because, wow. Um, but he was still in control. God was still in control, and he was actually using this situation to show his power, his sovereignty. He can use anybody and anyone at any time. And he um, is just basically asking us to do what's right by his, his ways. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. 
So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and the family, love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king. As a free member of our society, the United States of America, but also a representative of Christ, we are called to follow the laws, to respect and honor those in authority, even when they are not honorable people, and then seek him as we take action and we do what a citizen here should do. We should pray and ask God. Pray and ask God to lead you to his will, even for who to vote on, even who to support. Ask God, even if you don't like any of the options, ask God, what would you have me to do? I want to be obedient to what you're saying. I want to submit to your will, and I need your help to lead me and guide me. We have to advocate for what's right, but here's the thing. We have to do it in love. Love does not advocate by going online and spewing ugliness and spewing hate and having conversations that bring people down and leave them in a pit of despair. That is not the love that God would have us to show. It means that we watch what we say to other people, even in our opinions. It means that we watch what we post or comment, even when we have a strong um, feeling about it or a conviction about it. It means being careful that love comes first even especially with those that we directly oppose. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you awake? Turn to them, say, are you awake? Because I think some of you might be falling asleep and it's all about waking up today. So in order to find out if we're awake, there are four questions that we can ask ourselves. Now these questions seem um, simple on the surface, but I encourage you this week to take these home and lay these questions before God and ask him to truly show you the answers. First question, am I doing everything I can to keep the peace even when I don't like it or don't want to? In Romans 12, he talked all about being peacemakers. Question two, would I be considered a model citizen, a model coworker, or do I make excuses for not doing what God is asking me to do? Question three, am I being respectful and bringing honor to those who are in authority in my life, both in public and also in private? And last, do I do my best to reflect Christ as his image bearer, especially towards those that I don't agree with or do not support? Guys, if you and me, as his Christ followers, have Jesus living, the spirit lives in me, that means I have the perfect model and the unlimited resource in me. If I cannot be the ultimate example through God's help, then who is going to be that person? We have the spirit living in us. We are the ones who have to rely on his example and his resource to help us get this done. I encourage you, if you take these questions to God, he will show up. It's going to be risky, but you should do it. Next, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to recognize, help us recognize that govern, many of the government issues are not salvation issues. They're usually not salvation issues, but here's what the enemy likes to do. He likes to twist those in our mind into making them salvation issues. He likes to use those things that we don't agree on to help divide the body of Christ. Instead of being one unified body, the enemy will use the little things to begin to make divisions in our body so that we get so worked up over certain issues, especially in this season, especially with politics and elections, we can get so loud. And by the way, I told you earlier, when I was sleepwalking, sleep talking, I often get very loud. The, the volume does not affect whether we are in line with what God is having us to say or do. We can get really loud and still be really out of line. Okay, that's a side note. Um, but our emotions, our emotions can get the best of us, and then we end up turning on our own people, our own body of believers, capital C Church, over things that are not even eternal issues. So we have to remember that salvation and eternity issues are primary, and government issues are secondary. Listen, <laughs> Our disposition, or the way that we treat people, the way that we interact with people, the way that we show God's love will always be more important than any government decision, than any leader, than 
any of it, uh, the way that we treat others, the way that we show his love will always trump everything else. And so if we don't get that right, think of how we are, you know, off the path, off the beaten path. And so many times we get caught up because we want to be a hero, maybe a hero for a political party or a top gossiper on the job. Everybody knows to come to me if you want to really be able to hoot and holler about that guy. We get caught up in the emotion of it and we get slowly pulled off track instead of being able to be a person who effectively, consistently displays God's love, which is what our goal should be. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be involved in politics. That doesn't mean we shouldn't advocate at our workplace. What it means is that all of those things should be secondary to God's love that we're showing. In fact, God actually calls us to love and pray for our enemies, not seek out to destroy them. If we are rooting for harm to any individual, or if we are waiting for somebody to fail so we can applaud, that is not showing God's love. How could we possibly have love in our hearts for these people if that is the avenue that we take? So it's not a coincidence that Paul wrote in chapter 12, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, keep the peace, and then he goes right into our civil duties. That's not a coincidence. Keep the peace, civil duties intentional. Because Paul knew that our flesh, our emotions, they're going to hijack our actions every single time if we allow it, especially with authority. Also, if you take a look at the laws for our country or, or many others, they are not able to be trusted to give us the proper actions to take or our ethics. There are things that used to be legal or still are legal that are not in line with what God says. And so we can't look to the laws to give us the actions that we should take. It's very simple. Like sinful humans cannot create legislation that will fix morality and morality will not earn your salvation anyway. So we can't look to that. We have to just look to God. Let's see if you've been paying attention. What should our response always be? <laughs> look to God. We have to pray. We have to seek God every single time. We have to pray for ourselves. We have to pray for our society. We have to pray for our leaders. Pray, pray, pray. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul writes, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. It says to pray for all who are in authority, all. Are we praying for those leaders that we don't even think should be in that position? Conviction. Are we praying for those people that we don't even think deserve to tell us what to do? Because I know more than them anyway. Are we praying for those people? Are we asking God to bless them? Or are we too busy waiting and hoping for their downfall? Over the last few months, there have been obviously many, many posts about politicians and elections and many, many people giving opinions and arguments and what they think. And in the workplace, many people complaining about their bosses or, you know, there's just, I get, the list can go on and on about how we push back. But in order to be fully awake to the things that God would have us to do and say, we only have to ask ourselves one question. Here's the question. Have we prayed for them? and about them more than we have done all of those other things? If the answer is no, which it definitely was not for me, then ask God to wake you up, to shake you, to stir your spirit, to be able to lay down those areas where you're just pushing back and you don't even realize it because you're sleepwalking. You look like you're doing the right things. Your coworkers would tell you you're doing the right things. But ask God to wake you up and make a change. Pastor Mike talked a few weeks ago about the false sense of security and how God had sent Paul to wake them up. And earlier I talked about sleepwalking and that typically happens in the nighttime, which is why that verse 11 and 12 kept popping out to me. The title, wake up. This is what Paul says. This is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. 
The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. He's referring to the return of the Lord. When Jesus comes back, every single one of us will stand before him and we will have to give an account for those thoughts that we had in private, for the actions that we took. And we don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I can tell you this one thing for sure. We are closer today than we were yesterday. Tomorrow, we will be even closer yet. Every day that passes is a day closer to standing before the King of Kings and answering for what he's telling us. And the enemy is very aware of that. He is going to be busier and more ruthless than he has ever been before because he knows his time is short. There's a, a lyric in the song by KB that says, when the game's about to end, you expect fouls. And I was thinking, how true is that? As I look around and I see the sin and depravity and, and just the enemy wreaking havoc because the game is about to end and he is up to everything he can possibly do to get people to not believe, to throw us off of the path that God would have us to be on. We have to have that same sense of urgency. Think about the difference of a football fan in the preseason versus the postseason. And that's kind of like hitting us right now, right? In the postseason, everybody knows the end is coming. Everybody is really paying attention to their favorite team. They know the game, the time, the players, the, the who's out. They are all alert and aware. So I've been praying, God, let the Holy Spirit give me a postseason type of urgency that you are coming back and that there are people who need to know you and I can't help them to know you when I'm spewing hate. And I can't help them to know you when I'm treating you this way over my opinion. That's not even eternal. It's this, this whole world is a vapor, but we are here to do things that will last for eternity. So we have to become a passionate and alert and we have to ask the Holy Spirit to create in us even when it means submitting to the people we don't like, even when it means praying for those leaders who we would rather get rid of and honoring the ones we don't agree with, don't like, don't support, whatever it is, but they are in that position of authority. It's not gonna be easy. <laughs> it's really not, but we can start the process today. In just a moment, we are going to collectively and individually pray together. But in order to humble ourselves and to be fully awake, we're going to make ourselves a little uncomfortable. Because you know when you're uncomfortable, you can't sleep. Who's ever tried to sleep like in an airport or on a bus or on the floor somewhere? It's very difficult to sleep when you're uncomfortable, right? This is why they make all the money off of the mattresses that will give you comfort and your good night's sleep. We have to make ourselves a little uncomfortable to be able to be awake to what God is saying to our spirit. So in a moment, we're gonna get on our knees, whether that means turning inside your chair, if you wanna come to the altar, unless you have a medical reason that you cannot get on your knees, which is totally understandable, I'm asking online and in the room that you join me in praying for our country, for, our, for ourselves, for our leaders, that we would be able to seek God and ask him to show us where we are sleepwalking, amen? Let's get on our knees together. <sighs> Dear God, we come before you humbly today. We recognize, God, that all authority and all power, it is yours. And there is nothing that has happened or is happening or will happen that you're not aware of and that you're not in complete control of. We know, God, that there is no human who can ever take even an ounce of control from you. And so I pray, God, that you would help us to recognize your authority as well as the systems and the levels of authority you have placed in our lives. God, we want to follow your instructions. We really do. And we know that this is totally impossible without your help. God, please forgive us for falling asleep. Please forgive us for being comfortable and not paying attention. God, forgive us for losing our desperation for you and thinking too much about the things of this world. 
Forgive us for not thinking enough about our mission here and the time that is running out. Wake us up today, I pray. God, reveal in us every single area that we are operating in our flesh and our selfishness and our rebellion. Engage with us as we seek you right now. Shake us if you must, because we know the time is short. We know that you're coming back, and we want to be found doing your work, not ours. For those of us in this room or online who find it safer and easier and more comfortable to just stay out of government issues altogether and to hide away from our responsibilities, God, I pray that you would show us that we are called to do those things, that we are called to do the things that a citizen would do, and I pray that you give us the courage to do them in love. Lead us this November, God, as we vote for our next leader, may we seek you more than we look around to our left and our right. May we seek you more than we ask others' opinions. We want to do what you would have us to do, God. For those of us who maybe use politics inappropriately or talk poorly about our leaders and our bosses, whether that be in public or private, we know that we end up dividing the body of Christ. We know that our comments and our stances can be aggressive. And we ask that you forgive us and instead give us a passion to speak your truth. Give us a passion to spread your message and your love to the world around us. God, may we seek you more than we do any of those things. Convict us where we have done wrong. Lead us to your perfect will and give us wisdom and direction of a good citizen. Give us an extra dose of grace and mercy because we know we cannot do this without you. So many of us work under bosses and leaders who make it really difficult to glorify you, but we want to do that. And so I ask that you come in our heart today and make a change, renew our minds. For those of us who are seeking you, who don't have a relationship with you, God, I pray right now that eyes would be opened, that they would know who you are and what you came for, and that your love would just flood hearts today. May people submit to your authority and recognize you're the only one who can show them the pure love and that you can provide everything that they need. And now, Lord, I lift up our church and its leaders. I pray that you would direct them and guide them and lead them. God, bless the works of their hands. Pastor David and Pastor Michael and Pastor Jay, lead them as they carry the mission that you've called them to. Help us to recognize that they are made of flesh and that they are going to make mistakes and they are going to make wrong decisions, but they will stand before you and give an account for that, but so will we. Help us to submit to their authority, to pray for them consistently with respect and honor in our hearts. And let us show them support so that we can strengthen this body of believers and spread your message. God, I pray for our state and national government leaders. I pray that you would give them wisdom and integrity. Give them compassion as they make such tough, tough decisions every single day. God, give them hearts that would seek justice and peace and help them to serve in that position with humility. Bless them, bless their families, bring them good health, bring them strength and courage every day. Allow there to be Christ followers put into place in their lives who will point them to you because you are their source and you have created positions of authority. And so I ask God that you bless every single government leader today. And lastly, Lord, we pray for each other in this family of God. We recognize that we all agree on who you are and what you've come to do, but there are so many other things that we don't agree about. Help us to not let that get in the way of our unity. Help it to not get in the way of our mission here and our ability to love like you have called us to love. Give us an awareness when our flesh would get in the way. Today we gladly receive your correction and we humbly accept whatever area of uncomfortability you need to make in our lives to wake us up because we want to be more like you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We're going to continue to worship and sing together. But as we do, if you're feeling convicted, that's, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you, showing you maybe the things that you've said, the things that you've done that we're not honoring. If you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you, don't hide from that. If he's showing you that boss or that government leader, don't hide from that because here's the amazing thing. Jesus is the only one who can show us everything we've done wrong. And instead of leaving us feeling yucky and 
ashamed and unloved, he leaves us feeling free. He leaves us feeling forgiven when we allow him to deal with our messy stuff. That's why he came, to deal with our messy stuff. And when we allow him to deal with that, we can be like the woman at the well who went running with joy to tell everybody what God had, Jesus had just told her. And it was a bunch of ugly stuff. We can be that person. Let him deal with your stuff today as we continue to sing and worship. And we also have prayer partners in the back if you'd like someone to pray with you. Amen. You can stay seated if you want. Just use this time to honor God in the way that you feel like you can with your relationship with him.
that love is the main thing. The fact that a God so big and so great that spoke the world into being loved us, loved you so much to step into humanity that the author of the story was willing to become a page within the book just so that you and I could have a relationship with him. That's the main thing. Thank you, Pastor Amy, for that message. My favorite part is when you said eternity, Jesus, the gospel, that's primary. Government, your boss, that's secondary. But one of the greatest parts about this relationship with Jesus is he gives us this not so little helper called the Holy Spirit so that when we walk in relationship, we walk in unity with him, the overflow of the Holy Spirit gives us responses that don't conform to the world, but are filled with respect, with kindness, with gentleness, with goodness, with self-control. And it's all because of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. That is the main thing. And because of the main thing, those secondary issues within the home, within the job, within the government, our response can be an overflowing of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. Amen? If you don't have that, if you don't know this God, if you haven't experienced the love of Jesus, the relationship with him in your life, we would love to introduce you to this Jesus. We would love to help you along that journey, and we have resources for you. The first is called, He Did This Just For You. And it's just the introduction to this story, the gospel, Jesus' rescue mission for us. And the next one is called First Steps. And that's for if you've accepted this story of the gospel and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus. You want to begin to follow him. And then the ultimate resource is God's word, the Bible. And we would love to help you and we would love to place that in your hands. Because that is our goal here, here at Riverside. We are here to help you find and follow Jesus. And church, I am so, so grateful for you, for the way that you love, for the way that you serve, the way that you give. And we have something to celebrate this morning. This weekend, we, uh, we participated in Serve the Berg, and over 65 people served at Redeemer Lutheran School. They painted, they landscaped, they did all this work. And, over, and, and eight people served at Light of Life Ministry. If you're not familiar with Light of Life, it's, it's uh, inner city work that helps people that are, that are addicted to drugs, that are homeless, that are in need of, 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 of food and, and of, of shelter, but more importantly, are in need of the gospel. And so that's what our church was doing this weekend. And so I thank you for your generous giving. I thank you for being a part of this church that is so clear on the vision that is the main thing, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, church. Before we go about our day and about our week, let me just pray for you. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for the main thing. We thank you, Jesus, for, for loving us first, for choosing us first, and for subjecting yourself to the cross so that we could become members of your family, Lord. And God, I pray this week that our relationship with you, our intimacy with you would inform the way that we respond to authority, God. That our responses to authorities, whether they, whether they are acting on your behalf or whether they are disobeying you, God, whether those authorities are for you or against you, that our response would be out of overflowing of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. God, we thank you over and over again because you are holy and you are worthy, Jesus. Would you guide us? Would you lead us and protect us through this week? We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Well, church, we love you, and we will see you next week.